fools that when your opponent has the opportunity to re to rebut but fails to do so, okay, then your letter is valid. Okay, so you have a valid letter, it was never rebutted, and you have an affidavit that stands as true before the court and it's basically unrebutted in court. Well, these are strong positions. We don't let obviously once Request the process has been entered, either as a defendant or as a plaintiff. And when you get involved in the court process, of course, you you've got uh, you know a complaint that you filed or a complaint you're answering. You've got motion practice. Well, what do we do in motion practice and what do you, we do in the complaint? We follow the process and the logic and the positions that we've used from, from the very beginning. So in our complaint and in our motions to the court, we will use the same charges, statements, and affirmations that we used in our original letters. And we usually write a series of letters, it's not just one letter. And the same charges we've made in our affidavits, okay, that have never been rebutted, we'll use those in our complaint. Well, logically, and logic is not part of, of human society anymore, but logic is a very part of, very strong part of our process. Because our process is not our process. It's a constitutional process. The Constitution made this available for all of us. We're simply using the Constitution as it was designed to be used by the people to protect their rights, protect their interests. So if, in fact, your opponent is looking at... If I'm uh, reverberating or what have you, or I'm not coming across well or... <clears throat> Squeaky, let me know because I can't really hear. If, in fact, you're making a complaint against your opponent, and in the complaint you're using the same charges you use in your letter and your affidavit, which have never been rebutted, can your opponent rebut your charges in the complaint? The answer is no. They can't. Okay? They can't even talk about them. So they don't. He'll talk about something else. They'll switch the focus. They can't. They're required to rebut the charges in your complaint. You'll try to use a demur, an overall objection. In most states, that's prohibited. I don't know about Massachusetts. It's probably prohibited here, too. Okay? Specific rebuttals based in fact law and evidence must be used against the charges. Well, again, your opponent never rebutted anything in your letters. He never rebutted anything in your affidavits. He can't rebut anything in your charges. So what do we do? We get involved in motion practice. We'll do a motion for summary judgment, okay, if we're the plaintiff. And we'll base the motion for summary judgment on the fact that our opponent never rebutted anything, never even addressed anything. So in the federal rules, under state rules, he's admitted to everything and is consented to the granting of all our motions, okay? Well, we follow this up with what we call request for admissions. And as I say, request for admissions is a very good way to enter the discovery process and nail your opponent, okay, and get things into the evidence file, all right? And to let your opponent realize that he has no position, okay? So what do we put into the request for admissions? Same thing we put into the original letters, the affidavits, the complaint, and the motions. Same, same thing, same charges. If they've never been rebutted all the way through, how in God's name can it rebut them and request for admissions? A request for admissions is simply written statements that you make to your opponent. And you give your opponent two choices, admit or deny. And if he denies, he has to deny with particularity and facts, large evidence to support his denial. He just can't say deny. He has to support his denial, okay? They never, never support their denials, okay? Most of them will drop out, give in. But they won't give in right away. They're going to fight you to the nail, 
But if you maintain your constitutional position, they will buckle. Not every time. Because you're going to reach that entrenched opposition that will never give in. But 75 to 80 percent of the time, we have found that they will. But you must never give up your victories. You must never give up your points gained. You must never retreat from your positions. And if you can maintain that, you can maintain victory. Now let's just take a look at these four methods, okay? Present the letter, the affidavit, the complaint, or the answer, if you're a defendant, okay? And going through motion practice and requests for admissions, all right? Again, if no one has rebutted you from the very beginning to the very end, the victory should be yours. The victory usually is yours. If you don't give up ground gain. The problem with most people is they give up ground gain. We don't. On the affidavit, we're invoking federal rules of evidence 902 and, and 201 and state rules as well. And number four, which is probably the most critical, buying and through the, the filing of your request for admission, okay, you not only have facts and evidence, guess what you have? You have undisputed facts and evidence. How can any judge, pursuant to his own, any court, pursuant to oath taken, under any concept of constitutional competence or constitutional jurisdiction, to file those positions? They don't, at least not with us. But again, we've had practice in this. We've been doing this for many, many years, okay? It doesn't happen overnight. But if you are persistent with what you do, you can start gaining victories in your own community, okay? And you'll be in our hotel film, All Rights Reserved, and we were in Florida one day, and this young woman looks at the film and she said, I, 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 I can't accept that. And I said, excuse me? She said, I can't, I, I can't accept that. I said, you can't accept what? You can't sign your name that way. I said, excuse me, but you may not tell me how to sign my name. Well, why are you doing that? I said, I think it's pretty self-evident, but I'll explain it to you. I'm reserving my rights. Well, what does that mean? You're not going to pay your bill? I said, no. <laughs> I said, it means purely and simply that should something go wrong, should you folks breach this contract with me, I preserve my rights to take action against you if necessary. So it translates to something very simple. You do your job, I do mine. So I have to check with my manager. I said, go right ahead. So she trots off to this office and this fellow comes out. He looks at it and he says to me, I have no problem with that, ma'am. And I said, thank you. Now the girl comes back to the counter and she said, I never heard of this before. You mean you can do that? I said, yeah. She said, you, you, you can just reserve your rights? I said, yeah. She said, well, I, how do you do that? I said, you put that above your name. I said, are you an American citizen? Well, yeah. I said, then you have inherent natural rights protected for you in the Constitution. But if you don't know it, you don't claim them, and you don't enforce them, who's going to do it? She said, wow, what a concept. I'm so sorry I gave you a hard time. I said, don't worry about it. And she said, I'm going to put that on all my papers from now on. I said, good for you. Yes. It's not living because it's not being enforced. And if we don't start doing that, um, I don't know where we're going to go as a society. It's bad now. Think about 10 years from now, 20 years from now. We have 10 grandkids. What's going to happen to those grandkids down the road? I don't know. But it's not going to be good. Okay? Well, how can we make it good? We can make it good by, again, holding these guys to their jobs. Now, what I'd like to get into right now are the constitutional challenges. Do you guys have copies of the constitutional challenges? Very strong and well written. And, of course, the federal judge that I appeared before was a scumbag, and I think he took a bribe. And he dismissed the case and essentially um, made a grandstand play of letting me know that uh, he, if I could demonstrate to him that some of the cases that I cited that supported my position were actually real, that he wouldn't charge me uh, attorney's fees and you know, costs and sanctions and all this garbage. I did so, and that was the end of that, and I appealed it. 
the appeals court uh, for the Tenth Circuit in Colorado was a joke. Yeah. They didn't even read anything. They regurgitated the same crap that the original judge did, which was the same crap that the defendants did, which was a completely off-point defense that it made absolutely no reference to what the merits of my case were. So I was so angry that I went to the Supreme Court. And I really believe that when my case was docketed and it was on to committee to be reviewed, nobody had really looked at it up to that point. When somebody actually read it, when one of the law clerks actually read the case, they must have said, we can't hear this case. Because all the points that were made completely proved my case, my argument that I have the right as an American citizen to freely choose not to participate in a voluntary system, which is what Social Security is. There was no way that they could refute that because I had fact and law and evidence to support my claims. So at the last minute, they politely declined to hear my case after having accepted it. And I think that most people who have had any truck with the Supreme Court realize that that's the biggest scam on the planet. Mm -hmm. It really has nothing to do with justice. We have to get back to the one Supreme Court which really does uphold the Constitution. Either it's the law of the land or we're all kidding ourselves. So we have to push it to the point where there isn't a question in our minds anymore. Where you can go into a court of law and you know that the judge sitting there has not only taken an oath, but he intends to abide by the oath. And if he doesn't, that you have the power as a citizen to remove that man from office. And that goes back to how do you do that? And one of the things we've been encouraging people is to get sheriffs elected who understand the law. Now Massachusetts, I know, has killed off their county sheriff system, have they not? No, Connecticut. No, Connecticut. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Connecticut. It's Ron State. And, and how corrupt, yes, corrupt we could. What, what a perfect way to start assassinating, you know, the citizen's only elected law enforcement officer. If I had a, an elected sheriff in my community, okay, who would have stood up for me, I could have had a judge pulled right off the bench then and there. That federal judge that I went up against in federal court was so evil and vile that I think if Jack could have, you know, karate chopped his neck, he would have that day. That's how it, arrogant, at this judge, his name was Bruce Black, black-hearted SOB. He had the audacity to ask me if I'd gone to law school. <laughs> and I said, no, why do you ask? He said, well, what's your interest in the law? You seem to know a lot about the law. What's your interest in the law and taxes? I said, well, first of all, let me correct you. I have no interest in taxes. I said, but I do have a lot of interest in the law, in particular the law of the land and constitution, as all good citizens should. Would you not agree? Put his eyes down. <laughs> he had the audacity to ask me if I thought that my rights were equal to or superior to those of a corporation. I said, yes, I do. And he said, why do you think that? I said, my rights are guaranteed in the Constitution. I said, corporations are not, regardless of what any courts have said after the fact. He said, that's interesting, because that's exactly the opposite of what I tell my juries every day yeah. before they make decisions. A Wait city a judge. So he told you that? Yes, he did. Do you have that on record? Yes, yes. I do. So what have you done about that? Well, I did send him a letter of intent to sue, but I haven't followed through with it because I'm too busy helping no, everybody else. You have the actual transcript in your hand that yes. says that yes. that's not what yes. I tell the jury. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, this case was an interesting case because the Supreme Court accepted it, and then, as Margie said, someone read it. Well, one of the clerks had to read it and said, we can't hear it, because the court, the Supreme Court is required, okay, quote, required, I hate to do that, required to hear things on constitutional basis. It doesn't. It was required, okay? So technically, when the court accepted the case, it was required to hear the argument on constitutional issues. She was going to speak for herself. I was going to be her counsel, because that's guaranteed, okay? Yes, it is. It's going to act as her counsel. So the two of us were going to go before the Supreme Court. We were given dates for oral arguments. We were ready to go, and brought, what, two months before that? We get the notification. A one-liner from the Supreme Court saying, upon further review or further reconsideration, 
we declined to hear the case. Period. Yeah. Case closed. Okay. And, and what happened to your appeal? Well, that was the final appeal to the Supreme Court. Okay. But the issues, as I said, were on were on taxes and on the Social Security system, and both of those would have been basically destroyed through this constitutional argument. Okay. Yeah. Well, they couldn't have that. Now we're going to talk about this. See, as defendants, you have a very strong position in court, very strong position, especially if you use constitutional arguments. As a plaintiff using constitutional arguments, and basically we went on the offensive. When you go to the Supreme Court, that's not defensive. That's offensive. When you become offensive, okay, even though you're defending a position, you're challenging the whole system, the entire system. The entire system does not like to be challenged. Okay. Let me ask you, does the Supreme Court have any lawful jurisdiction over any American citizen? No, it does not. Does any court in this country have any lawful jurisdiction over any American citizen? What kind of court are you speaking of? Any court. I don't care what it is. Well, if it's within the state, and let's say if I enter into a contract with you, and if I breach that contract, you have a right to sue me. So you have a right to enter court, and I have to, you know. I guess it's too broad of a question what you're asking. You have the right to be heard in a constitutionally competent court of proper jurisdiction. You have the right, okay? There is no constitutionally competent court of proper jurisdiction anywhere in the United States of America. Let's take the Supreme Court. These are supposed to be constitutional experts. Agreed? Okay. Supposed to be, in theory. In theory, okay? Well, if that's the case, why don't we have 9-0 decisions all the time? Why don't we have 5-4, 6-3, 7-2? They're not constitutional experts because they don't deal in constitutional issues. They pretend to deal in constitutional issues. Have there been some constitutional issues decided out of the Supreme Court? Recently, yes, there have been. And in the past, there have been. Okay? But the court is not a court of constitutional competence because it doesn't deal in constitutional issues as required across the board. Constitutional challenges. See, the guy will say, yes, Your Honor, the government's ready to go. Mr. Flynn, are you ready to proceed? No, sir. It's never, Your Honor. Why? There are no titles of nobility in America. Okay? This is supposed to be an egalitarian society. No titles of nobility prohibited by the article. So, we'll say, no, sir, no, judge. A few matters we'd like to discuss are resolved before we go further. And he usually says, go right ahead. And we'll say right away, sir, you and the U.S. Attorney have taken oaths of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. Is that correct? We'll make a statement, and then we'll confirm the statement with a confirming question. Is that correct? Fifty-three years of doing this, every case I've ever had, yes. Yes. Okay? Follow it up. 1B. With all due respect, sir, you and the U.S. Attorney are required to abide by those oaths in the performance of your official duties, especially those before this honorable court. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Flynn, that's correct. Okay? We just gained two major constitutional victories. It seems simple, and it is simple. But we just converted that court into a constitutional forum. Okay? Now, we convert the court into a constitutional forum by and through documents we file with the court. One is called a mandatory judicial notice that converts that court from the corporate crap court that it is into an Article III court operating under the federal Constitution in which all of your rights are required to be respected by a judge who is required to serve in times of good behavior. Okay? But we confirm it verbally in the court by the answers from the judge, not only for himself, but for his or for my opponent and my opponent's attorney. 
Okay? So the judge doesn't answer just for himself. He answers for the attorney. And the attorneys don't like that. Okay? And some attorneys try to object. All right? Well, in most states, like New Mexico, probably true here in Massachusetts as well, somewhere in the state statutes is a um, condition or a statute that requires the attorney's first duty to support and defend the Constitution. Okay? A lot of people don't know this. Under New Mexico, it's NMSA 36-2-10. Okay? First duty of any attorney, whether he work for the state or his private, is to support and defend the Constitution. Well, let's go a little beyond that. The attorney is also an officer of the court, isn't he? Okay? And the attorney also takes an oath to the federal Constitution as well. All right? So the attorney has three requirements upon him. And any time any attorney tries to oppose any rights guaranteed in the Constitution, we will move to have that attorney removed from that court because of his treason against the Constitution, his fraud upon the court, and his opposition to rights guaranteed in the Constitution. We play nasty. We're not nice in court. Okay? Margie sometimes is nice, but even she gets nasty. Yes, sir. When you, uh, Yeah. Must do the mic and talk. Not much time to prepare, but uh, the instructions were very sound. And I used this methodology uh, to turn that court into a constitutional court. And it was um, beautiful. <laughs> 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 Over there. <laughs> I had some witnesses there, and thank you for your support. Uh, it was amazing uh, uh, how you could just sense it in the room, how they went from completely uh, uh, arrogance and pride and uh, um, not, not interested in, in uh, holding up your rights to all of a sudden they had a newfound respect and uh, treated you with uh, uh, much more um, significance. So uh, I, uh, I don't know what more you want me to say about that, Jack, but it was... Uh, I just wanted to answer your question. When you asked him, you uh, you take an oath of office to the United States. Is that correct? What did he say? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, we should ask that because when I started off with the judge, she would not answer the question. Yeah. And then when I went to the U.S. Attorney, he wouldn't answer the question. Non-responsive. Non-responsive. And then uh, without going through the details of what um, the, the, the language I used, I went to the IRS agent. And he wouldn't answer the question, but by the grace of God, the um, the magistrate said that she wanted the IRS agent to answer the question. So he reluctantly got up and answered the question. And then I followed up to the U.S. Attorney again, not wanting to take no for an answer. And I asked the U.S. Attorney a second time. He didn't want to answer, but then the, the magistrate asked him to answer the question. But she herself wouldn't answer. No, but then, I don't know how it came out. This is so beautiful. But I just naturally just turned to her, and I just said, um, and I'm, with all due respect, uh, I'm assuming the same is true for you, um, Your Honor. And uh, she just admitted, yes, I've actually taken the oath three times, she said. Wow. So then everything changed at that moment. You just, and then I started going down the list of the other questions, and at the end of the, uh, the hearing, she ruled three, three times in my favor, not once against me. So I think I'm into a very lengthy uh, legal battle, uh, paperwork battle, I should say. And, uh, so it, it's difficult. It's not easy to do, but uh, you, you have to be able to stand up there and, and turn that court into a court that favors you. Was this a uh, hearing for books and records or something yes, else? Yes, exactly right. And did they rule that you had to produce books and records after that meeting? Yes, actually, they did. Yeah, which is technical, they do. Yes. Um, you went through it the hard way. It's a much easier way, the way I did it. How's that? Just simply say, by giving this information to this IRS chump over here, <laughs> does that mean it avoids my Fifth Amendment right under, uh, no, right to incriminate. Right to incriminate, but I'm trying to guard the versus United States. No. 
felt, even though after production rule. And the judge, and the judge said, yeah, it violates your Fifth Amendment right. That's why I invoked my Fifth Amendment. I refused to give this chump over here any of my information. <laughs> so finally, the judge did rule in my favor. He looked over to chump and said that uh, he doesn't have to give you that information. Then I was like, as I got up, he's screaming and hollering about the information. So I went over to open my briefcase and I dumped out all the information. Because the judge said, are you here because of the subpoena? I said, yes, I am. He said, did you bring your records with you? I said, I'm here because of the subpoena. So when it was over, I walked over to the chunk, opened my briefcase, dumped all the empty newspapers that I had in there, I got all the old newspapers, closed it, walked out. Well, God bless you. I, I wasn't that experienced, and um, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. But the Fifth Amendment is the, is the shortest, sweetest, and best way to win. Yeah, I You're out the door. I think you're right. The federal marshal just stood there looking at me, give me a dirty look, and I went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, wasn't that the judge's uh, initial response when you when uh, you asked the judge? Uh, well, I'm not here to answer any questions. What I want to know from Dr. Mark is when you get someone that says something like that, what would be your response to that statement? Said so I didn't ask any questions. I made a statement, and I want either the courthouse, okay, uh, or, the, or the county offices, or the Secretary of State, okay? The oath should be available for public scrutiny, all right? Also, most states require what they call faithful performance bonds or surety bonds, which are also required, okay, to be filed usually with the Secretary of State. And if they're not filed, then they're not available for public scrutiny. And in most states, uh, this is pretty serious as it is in New Mexico. I'll tell you a story about that later on. <clears throat> the faithful performance of the surety bond is a requirement, okay, that is precedent to office, without which no duties of office can officially be discharged. Right? No official duties can be discharged. It's a precedent condition. It's a condition precedent to office. In other words, surety bond or faithful performance bond. And without that bond, no judge has authority if it's required in that state to assume the position or conduct any duties at the office, okay? So these are things that we use all the time, all right? Now, if a judge is not willing to abide by his oath, or if a judge is uh, uncertain or leaves it uncertain as to whether he's taken an oath, then the oath has not been confirmed. And if the oath has not been confirmed, it's not available for public scrutiny. He has no authority to serve in that position, and he's disqualified. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Mr. Flynn. some people are timid in court. Cannot be timid in court. All right? You have to get out there, and you have to take the hit. You have to give the hit. Sometimes you have to take the hit. And sometimes the judge will say, I'll hold you in contempt. Yeah. Okay? And the first thing that our people say is the claim and exercise of the constitutional right cannot be converted into a crime. Do you wish to reconsider that, sir? <laughs> okay? Do you wish to convert my claim of a constitutional right into a crime? That's a crime by you, sir. Okay? Pursuant to your oath. Of course. See, so you, you, you cannot take nonsense from these people. You don't have to get up and yell and scream. I do. She doesn't. I do. But you don't have to do that, but you have to be very, very direct. Mr. Flynn. On, on the issue of oaths, now, I'm speaking to the, close to the camera so people can hear you. Okay. They won't holler at us. On the issue of this, of the oh. You want me to? Yeah. Oh. That way we never get it on the tape. Too. I don't know. <laughs> Just stay close enough. To get you on the issue of oaths, when I was speaking to friends of mine about having them be encouraged to come here today, one in particular who said he had done a great deal of traveling the last five years just to conferences said that he met someone who gave him a very interesting fact that will not necessarily be known to many of us here. And I thought, well, I trust you guys, being the experts, so I'd bring it to you. Well, this was a very interesting thing because he said that he met a lawyer who said that upon their 
oath-taking when they are sworn in to become lawyers, that they actually have an oath, a secret oath, that no, no, no yes. one else knows about, that they are aware that the Constitution was eradicated in 1939, yes. and that it was treasonous for them to do anything other than when constitutional issues are brought up in court and remain on track, which is what you do, that if they say anything to indicate that they are following anything other than the Constitution, that they are actually found to be treasonous. They've signed their oath. It says to the Constitution right there. So that would contradict that theory. Uh, I've seen your own. Exactly. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Flynn.